Hello, everyone, and welcome to MIT Sloan Alumni Online. Every month, we're bringing you the latest breaking news, cutting edge research, groundbreaking ideas, and school updates from MIT Sloan faculty, staff, and alumni. Today, we're thrilled to have Heidi Zak and Dave Spector on the program from the MBA class of 2007. Heidi Zak and Dave Spector are co-founders and co-CEOs of Third Love. They knew they wanted to start a business together since their first meeting at MIT Sloan, but it took a trek to Everest Base Camp years later to help them actually make it happen. And Heidi and Dave, we want to hear that story. Prior to Third Love, Heidi was director of International of Aeropostale, holding a P&L for the division before joining Google as a marketing executive. She's been named Fortune's 40 Under 40 and Fast Company's Most Creative in Business, among other honors. Prior to Third Love, David focused on consumer internet and e-commerce investments as a partner at Sequoia Capital and invested $65 million during his time there. Today, he is an angel investor in two dozen companies and has keynoted numerous events on the challenges and successes that come with building businesses. In 2013, frustrated by the bra shopping experience and an industry badly needing disruption, Heidi and Dave started Third Love. They knew there was opportunity to build a better intimate apparel company with perfect fitting product that didn't require cramming into a dressing room and a shopping experience centered around personalization. Today, Third Love is more than 300 people across four offices and is proudly one of the largest charitable donors of bras in the United States. Heidi and Dave, thanks for joining us. I will now turn it over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Greg. Hey, everybody. Cool. So we thought we could just start today and kind of walk through how this came to be. Um, it's kind of crazy for us because about six years ago, we were in our living room um, having quit our jobs at Google and Sequoia Capital, and we had this crazy idea. And today, you know, flash forward uh, six and a half years, here we are with over actually 300, I think we just crossed 350 teammates across four offices around the world. So it's been a, it's been a crazy ride. So uh, this is a photo of us at Everest Base Camp. Uh, we, um, taking a step back, actually, Dave and I met at business school at MIT in um, late 2005. Um, we got married in 2009. Uh, and we, um, in 2011, were hiking to Everest Base Camp. And we, on the way, had a lot of time to just talk. Uh, about ideas because there's nothing to do. And so as we were walking, I was talking to another woman on the trip about bras and how uncomfortable they are and why that shopping experience is just so terrible. And that was really the first time we had that idea. And so from there, um, if you flash forward another six months, um, we started the company and left our jobs. And so the goal at Third Love is really to help women feel comfortable and confident in their everyday lives. And I'll say that for a lot of the people out there that are probably joining and thinking through their own entrepreneurial endeavors, we started this business from our living room uh, with just a seed of an idea, uh, obviously in, in an unusual place uh, on, uh, at Everest Base Camp. Uh, and ideas can really come from anywhere. And I would say that uh, as it relates to the purposes of this webinar for MIT Sloan alumni or just the MIT community broadly, um, pursue those ideas, go after them. Um, anything's possible. And I think that um, MIT certainly connected the two of us together. We're married now as well. Uh, but MIT also sort of gave us the toolkit and the skills to really be able to pursue this. Um, so hopefully what we talk about today and through some of your questions, uh, we can help make some of you out there who are thinking about entrepreneurial uh, endeavors more confident uh, to actually go out and pursue them yourselves. So there's really three ways that we've defined the $330 billion apparel industry. So, and we actually, this is a very similar deck that we've used uh, with other students uh, when we've taught classes with investors. This has actually remained almost exactly the same since we started the company, uh, ironically. And so the apparel, apparel 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 concept is a really good way of thinking of how the industry that we operate in is changing. And apparel 1.0 
really is some of the players uh, like Gap, Victoria's Secret, Aeropostale, where Heidi worked after MIT Sloan. Um, and these are folks that use very traditional sizing based on fit models, have a very much a retail driven business model. They're working on changing that today, uh, but still very much retail driven and very much considered uh, legacy in that way. Um, and working on uh, and working hard on adapting to a changing landscape, uh, but still very, very much focused on bricks and mortar. Secondly is really for the fast fashion players. So H&M, Zara, um, these folks have done incredible things to their supply chain through flexibility, um, continual on demand. There's all these things that are very impressive, but it's still very much retail driven. What we said was, how do we actually take the best characteristics of, of this evolving, in evolving landscape and create an entirely different company. So there are really three things that we outlined. One is building a very, very authentic brand that allowed people to connect with, that allowed us to connect directly with our customers and to have a direct conversation with them, right? And to be true to who we are and what we wanted to focus on from the beginning. Secondly, it was really having incredible product. This goes hand in hand with building any business, but for what we were doing in a category that has very, very complicated product, uh, and very difficult to manufacture product, this was incredibly important and also very, very hard to do. And we underestimated that at the beginning. Um, and then lastly, is creating a really amazing personalized experience that's very, very much web and technology driven. Um, and so we'd like to <laughs> show this. this slide. Um, this is a, a whiteboard from our first co-working space office where there was four of us sitting around a table. We didn't even have a brand name. And we were yeah. brainstorming what were, was the core mission of the company. Um, and you can see up here, we talked about, um, we believe you're, you, know, you should look great, feel great. Um, we talked a lot about fit. Um, and this idea of creating a radical new way to shop for a bra. And why we show this is actually, we get asked the question a lot, like how has the vision, the, the, the vision of Third Love changed over time? And, um, and the answer is it really hasn't. So it's sort of what we set out to build in the early days actually is what we have built today. And this is a photo of our first um, manufacturing partner in Mexico. In the early days, um, we thought that leveraging NAFTA being close to our factory would really help us um, get off the ground. And what we quickly realized was we weren't getting the quality we needed from Mexico um, from this factory and we had to pivot. So this was one of the many learnings and kind of mistakes we made along the way. Um, certainly uh, in the early days, it sometimes felt like everything was going wrong. Um, so where are we today? Um, we've sold over a 3 million bras. Um, we have close to 2 million active customers at this point. Uh, we've really built a company centered around data um, and leveraging data to create um, the best shopping experience for our customers. And we have Saturday. over 350 employees, as we talked about, and um, four offices around the world. So jumping into the brand, uh, what we set out to build was a brand that really connected with what I called the modern woman. So on the left side of the screen, you see one of our emails where we're talking about um, what kind of bra do you wear under a white top, right, that helps you um, not see your bra. And the answer is it's not a white bra. Um, it's actually a, a nude colored bra that best matches your skin tone. Um, and you can see how that's different kind of from other types of marketing um, that is very common in the bra space. This is a, a snapshot from our Instagram feed. Uh, we have, we're really proud of the fact that we actually have used real women um, and diversity and not just um, ethnicity, but also body shape and size and even life stage. So focusing on women kind of from their teens through their 60s and everything in between. And this really gets to the authenticity of what we talked about in building the brand. Uh, and it was one of the core tenets of the business. And it's interesting. So for those thinking about building brands, actually sticking to, if you lay out what the core values are of your brand at the beginning of starting the business, what you'll see is it will never be that way at the beginning. And these, these are one of, this is one of those things that has to evolve. And it just gets better over time as, as you get larger, as you have more budget, as you figure things out, and as you listen to your customer. Um, and actually, this is sort of the evolution of Third Love. One of the slides that we should show it, uh, when we do these things is what the brand looked like five years ago. 
um, because mm -hmm. it has evolved. Uh, and I think that it's important to realize that something like this and what's on our current Instagram account um, today isn't what it was at the beginning. Very true. <laughs> So jumping into the product, um, really there was this idea around sexy bras that aren't comfortable or comfortable bras that aren't beautiful. And one of the things we've done at Third Love is really blend those lines and focus on creating really high quality, beautiful um, bras that are stylish and comfortable. And we've done that by focusing on every detail. One thing that most people don't know, and I don't think we knew when we set out building this company, was how difficult it is to manufacture a bra. They have over 30 components per item. And so we really focus on every single detail and the creation of the bra to make it as comfortable as possible. And what's interesting is that in the manufacturing process, again, being outsiders to this industry, I think some people would say that we needed to have a background in intimate apparel to build a business like this. And in fact, at the beginning, <laughs> there, were, there were so many things stacked against us that we probably wish we did. But in retrospect, in fact, having an outsider's point of view and building something that was, and looking at this with really fresh eyes and saying, here's how the industry works today, and here's why what we think is entirely broken, and again, having no prejudice whatsoever was hugely helpful in order for us to actually get manufacturing off the ground. And one of the biggest things that we had to do was around manufacturing. Um, and again, as Heidi said, very much underestimated uh, with the complexity of it. Um, so one of the things I mentioned was this idea of a nude bra. Well, what is nude? Um, one of the things that we learned from our customers from the early days was offering one shade of nude didn't match at, um, most women's skin tones. So we really took that to heart. And about two and a half years ago, we launched a line of different shades of nude um, to better match um, more women's skin tones. So we're constantly listening to customer feedback, both through the data, so quantitatively, as well as qualitatively through interactions with our fit stylists to help create a company um, and a brand that and product that our customers love. And I think that's been really key to our success success. Um, you know, we carry double the amount of sizes as most other brands. And what that means is that more women can find their fit with us. And that's been something, again, really core to the inclusivity is offering that wide range of sizes. So today we go from a double A cup through an I cup, um, from a 30 band through a 48 band and everything in between. And, you know, one of the things that is interesting about, about this business is that we looked at the industry and said, well, why is it that the largest player, it's about a $16 billion mark in the United States, why is it that the largest player that represents 40 to 50% of the overall market only has 30 plus or so sizes? Uh, and really, the answer was quite clear. It's because they're inhibited by the fact that they need to have a stock room in a retail environment, right? And again, looking at this with fresh set of eyes from the beginning, we said to ourselves, well, we have the benefit of being online and having distribution centers uh, and not being confined to a retail store. So if we have the technical ability and the manufacturing capacity to build a lot more sizes, well, clearly, since every woman's body is different, we should have as many sizes as possible. And that's really what led us down that road. Um, and again, it's just having a very, you know, coming to the table uh, in this existing market with a very different frame of reference. Uh, so one of the things that we also do quite differently is without having a retail store and trying to figure out ways to enable women to get sized and fit from the comfort of home, uh, we came up with what is referred to today and trademarked as FitFinder. Um, and FitFinder for Third Love really is a, um, sorry, I thought it was flowing through. FitFinder is really a way for women to answer a number of questions uh, about their body type and breast shape and all these other questions dynamically changes. Um, it's really powered by um, our data science and data engineering team here at Third Love. Uh, and we have taken what is an existing retail um, sort of notion of having to get fit and using a measuring tape uh, and applied it in an online way. And in fact, uh, the results from that um, and our very, very low return rate basically say that women are far happier doing it this way than going into a, re going into a retail store and into a dressing room with a stranger. Um, but again, it was this concept of figuring out what didn't work in the existing market 
and finding ways to apply technology to build something that was fundamentally different. Um, and our breast, this is, this is, you know, if you Google breast shape dictionary right now, um, you'll see these images uh, and lots and lots of articles about um, what we've done around taking, you know, a, uh, a concept that people don't really want to talk about and, and, you know, having fun with it. So, this is actually, I think it's way more than six million at this point, but really what we said was, how do we build this business surrounded by data, right? So how do we apply personalization, inventory management, product development, and then lastly, FitFinder to power everything about this business? So for example, when we learn more about women's bodies and our customers' tastes and interests from FitFinder, that powers the types of product, that powers the types of product, that, product that we developed. And then knowing how people repeat and reorder from us powers the amount of inventory that we buy, right? Knowing the types of uh, model imagery to use, the types of customers that are coming to our website allows us to power, a very pa power our own personalization engine on the web. So all these things that we're doing are really surrounded by data. And I think that many companies today, in fact, I would argue every business on the planet talks about the importance of data and uses data in some sort of way because we had the benefit of really building this from the ground up without anything you know, there before, we were able to say, actually, let's build a business that is entirely surrounded by data. And so um, one of the things that we did in the past year was um, launch a campaign called To Each Her Own. Um, and the core focus of that was really inclusivity and the use of real women. And this is an example of a customer who sent a photo of herself in a bra um, talking about wanting to see um, women over the age of 30 in our marketing. And that was something we really took to heart. And through the To Each Her Own campaign um, that we launched last fall, we were able to showcase real women done um, on using street casting in Brooklyn um, that really represented the diversity and beauty of our customer base. And so that was something we were incredibly proud of and that you'll even see today um, in everything we do, whether that's our homepage, catalog, TV commercial, is really this diversity in, of, of, of real women. Um, and so one of the things that, uh, that Greg had mentioned um, we might want to talk about today was the the um, Victoria's Secret kind of open letter that that was written um, in November of last year and this all started um, based on a conversation I had with Robin Lawley who's who's up here on the screen um, she's a model she's been on the cover of Sports Illustrated and she was deemed to be too too big or not the right size for the Victoria's <laughs> Secret fashion show which is obviously crazy and um, and so we partnered with Robin Lawley to petition Victoria's Secret last October to be more diverse in their fashion show that they were going to air in November. Um, and from there, um, one morning we woke up last November and there was an article um, that uh, had gotten written by a woman, and uh, 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 an editor at Vogue, um, who had interviewed the chief marketing officer of Victoria's Secret. And the title of the article was, Where Nobody's Third Love Were Women's First Love. And that was a direct quote, by the way, from the interview with Ed Rasick. Uh, that he had said about us. So it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek way of taking a shot at us. Now, we know that uh, they have bought our product before. We're well aware um, of sort of their, somewhat of their focus on third love. But what happened was that comment led to a bunch of other articles, that comment and many others in this article, uh, particularly about their stance on women and how they view women and their fashion show, led to... Um, a lot of backlash against them um, from, you know, outside of Third Love and unrelated to Third Love, actually. Yeah, so some of the things, um, and we, this is, we don't have it in here. Some of the things that um, Victoria's me Secret mentioned was that they had tried using plus size models in the year 2000, um, but, you know, they weren't interested in trying it again. They would never use a transgender in their fashion show or feature transgender. Um, and they talked a lot about, you know, how women want to spend their time on a Sunday night is, <laughs> is watching a 42 minute quote unquote fantasy um, because that's f a fun activity. And so there was just a lot of things in this um, interview that, you know, we felt like was really wrong. Um, and also we felt like 
women should know that we disagree. And, um, and so we decided to take a stand and wrote an open letter, which we put into um, the New York Times in, um, in their Sunday um, paper. And it was just really a, a letter that spoke from the heart um, from me to, to anyone who would listen about why I was so upset. Um, and I just think, again, Oh, and, and sorry, Greg, we're on the last slide, but I'm not going to play it because it's actually a, a commercial, so I don't know if it'll work. Um, but I think the biggest thing here is that, um, and the moral of the story is really, we put our heads down and built a really big company and um, acquired millions of customers and really focused on doing good in the world. Um, we're also the largest donor donor of bras in, in the country. We've donated close to $15 million worth of bras since inception at Third Love. And that's something we're incredibly proud of. Um, and so it was an interesting moment in time for us as a brand where it was the question of, do we respond or do we not respond? And it was definitely a moment in time for us where we decided let's like put ourselves out there, take a stand, um, be more proactive with our voice and do hopefully do more good in the world. And so we're just really proud of the fact that we made that decision. And um, it's definitely um, something that I hear from women all the time and men actually many, many times men have read the open letter as well. Um, just that they felt like it represented something that was really needed to be said and needed to be heard. Yeah. And I, you know, what's, what's so interesting about that moment is I, uh, yes, sure, it's, you know, we're, there's now plenty of great articles about sort of third love versus uh, Victoria's Secret, but it's not about that. Uh, we have lots of other competitors, um, and the market's very large um, in the United States and in the world. It's really just about the fact that we happen to be very different than this large brand and have a very different um, thought on how uh, our brand should be perceived and the types of models that we want to use and the types of product that we put out. Um, and we, we, we go up to a size, into a size range that, that this company just doesn't even offer. And so um, I think it was, it was less about sort of us versus them and more about just us being very different. Um, we wanted to really take a stand in uh, obviously putting our foot out there with uh, a full page ad in the New York Times Sunday is, uh, was a big moment for the company and really a seminal moment for this brand and all of the teammates and people that we work with. Anyways, I, look, I think in, uh, it's, MIT Sloan is, was an incredible experience for the two of us. We graduated in 2007. Uh, we met there, we were married a couple years later. Um, and, you know, that really not only did it introduce the two of us, but it gave us the confidence to, and some of the skills and the toolkit that's required to really go out and build this business, uh, which is not easy. Uh, and I think that the, you know, sort of one of the important learnings is you just got to have the fortitude to keep going. Uh, and to not quit. And if you stick to your guns, you stick to sort of your core values of what you lay out at the beginning of the process of building a business. And that's why we always show that slide of, uh, of the, the whiteboard that we use at the beginning of Third Love, uh, which really hasn't changed much since. Um, you, can, you can end up uh, building something substantial um, and having a lot of fun along the way. We've, we've done that. So, uh, Anyways, Greg, do, do we want to turn it over to Q&A? Uh, we can do that. Um, so thank you, Heidi and Dave. Um, as a reminder to our participants, uh, you can type in your questions in the Q&A panel in the Zoom interface. And while you're doing that, we'll give folks a minute. Um, I'll have a few announcements to share uh, from Sloan. So as you all know, this Thursday, March 14th, it's an almost sacred day here at MIT. Um, it's Pi Day 3.14, and we're returning with the 24-hour Giving Day Challenge. We hope you will all join us uh, in supporting the Sloan Annual Fund on that day. We also have some upcoming virtual events uh, that alumni all over the world can tune into, much like this one. So on March 28th at 12 p.m. Eastern, we will hear from Associate Professor David Rand, who will discuss his work on misinformation and fake news. It's a fascinating topic and a great opportunity to hear from a new professor here at MIT Sloan. And lastly, in April, we will continue our careers webinar series uh, with Bryn Panay Burkhart from the Sloan Career Development Office. She'll present on intelligent networking. So of course, something vital uh, for all of us in our careers. So our viewers can find the full lineup of events on our website. 
and you can also find a link to previously recorded sessions. So I see that we have some questions coming in now um, through the Zoom interface. Please keep those coming. And we also took questions uh, via pre-registration. So we'll go ahead and get started with that. Um, so Heidi and Dave, thank you again. Um, you know, thinking about the beginning of Third Love, what really gave you the conviction um, that you could take on not only incumbents in the space, um, but also a number of other startups? Um. So the question I think about that is I just saw there was, we saw there was immense opportunity to do something different. And I think that's the biggest thing when you're starting a company, you're creating something because you don't see it in the world and you think it needs to be there. And so Victoria's Secret, as large as they are, um, and as much market share as they own or have a very distinctive aesthetic um, and focus on sexy and sort of how they sell product. And, and so it just what we built was always different and was going to be different. And I think that um, that's, you know, when you when you see that opportunity, that's you just decide, hey, why not? I, yeah, I don't think uh, I don't think you don't really think about you don't really think about it. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, you. You know, you just go for it. I don't think that you I, all of these markets are, you know, most of the markets in the United States, at least, are so large that and they're in such transition right now that you you just focus on what you want to do and what you want to build that's different um and fortunately we live in a world where uh it's pretty simple to uh or i should say straightforward to reach <coughs> customers uh and so whether it's email whether it's marketing whether it's just texting your friends um it's an amazing time and you know you think back to 20, 30 years ago, you know, you want to reach a customer, you got to put a store down. <coughs> uh, you have to have a store, whether you're selling widgets or whether you're selling bras. And so uh, it's a very different day and age where you can reach people in a far easier way. So we didn't really think it through. We knew we had something unique. I think we were, I'm sure we were naive. Uh, and we just got to work and quit our jobs and started. Great. Thank you. And I think something you just touched on, you know, certainly connecting with customers. Um, we've had a number of questions come in, um, both in advance and now live, around the marketing. Um, and you spoke about authenticity uh, in the marketing uh, at Third Love. So I was hoping you could say a little bit more about that um, and maybe go a little bit more into um, you know, how you structured your marketing at the beginning versus how it's structured now, perhaps. Yeah, in the early days, um, it was interesting. I remember our first first photo shoot we were doing and the photographer said, well, what lingerie brand do you aspire to be like, right? Because we were this no, no, we, we were nothing. We didn't, we didn't even have customers. And I said, nobody, not one brand out there represents what we want to look like. And so in the very early days, we were really focused on um, creating something inherently different, which was also very, very hard because when you don't have something to imitate, um, you really truly have to create it from scratch. And so, you know, certainly our marketing has evolved. Um, we, um, you know, you need money to shoot many body types. It, it's a very large undertaking in terms of investment. Um, and so from, you know, the early days we were focused on this idea of diversity, but if you flash forward, kind of what happened was we started really with this diversity of size and ethnicity. And then we really were able to layer on, um, in the more recent years, a focus on um, age diversity or life stage diversity. Uh, in this latest shoot in, that we launched in uh, February around our inclusive size launch, we had 78 models of every single size, which was an amazing undertaking by our creative team to accomplish that. And so it's, it's just been little by little as we've grown and we've had more budget, we've invested more back and um, constantly our are evolving the brand. The brand is is not static. Brands evolve over time, and ours certainly has too. Great, thank you. And I want to stay on a point about the human element and connecting with your customers, and you know that authenticity element. And so at Sloan, you know, the mission here is to develop principled, innovative leaders, um, and that's something that's certainly on display with your work at Third Love. You mentioned the open letter in the New York Times. So if it's all right with you, I just pulled out a quote from that, if I could read that, and then just ask you to say a little bit more. Um, so this is from the letter. 
Quote, we believe the future is building a brand for every woman, regardless of her shape, size, age, ethnicity, gender identity, or sexual orientation. This shouldn't be seen as groundbreaking. It should be the norm. Let's listen to women. Let's respect their intelligence. Let's exceed their expectations. Let women define themselves. And I'm sure that if uh, we unmuted the line, we'd hear clapping and applause uh, from our viewers. Um, so if you could just, again, take us back um, to that moment. And, you know, what advice would you share for other founders um, or managers who are making decisions and are, are taking that principled stand for their values? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you have to know who you are and what you stand for and what, what matters. And look, you're never going to be, I think one of the learnings we had is you're never going to be everything to everyone. Um, but in today's society, more than ever, the companies that are succeeding do have a strong voice. They do believe in something and they let, um, they let people know what that is. And so I think that, you know, for us, certainly um, being a company that sells products to women and a company that has a lot of women here, uh, we believe obviously in women and, and obviously with Dave is a male co-founder of a bra company. He believes in women, right? And he believes in the power of women. Otherwise, he wouldn't be here doing this every day. And so, um, and I think it takes a certain kind of, of, of husband to be co-CEOs with their wife as well. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I think that all of that goes together to say, you know, we spoke from the heart about what we truly believe. Um, and, and I think that's really important. It has to feel right for you and your company. Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's uh, taking bold, st stepping out, you know, uh, and being bold is not easy. Uh, and uh, to what Heidi said, I think it's just most important to stick to what you believe in and go for it. Uh, I mean, when you're, there's just, you know, take calculated risks. I think that, you know, starting a business in itself, uh, especially, when you get to this kind of stage, it's, it's, it's not easy and it's risky. And um, there's things that we do that we've de-risked and, de and then there's things that we continue to do that are really risky. Uh, and so I think sticking to those core values uh, and to what we believe in sort of allows us and gives us that sort of North Star to always point to when we're making decisions. Great, thank you. So one of the questions that has come in from our live viewers, we've gotten a lot of comments just saying thank you to both of you, which is uh, really great. We appreciate your time. So you touched on using data and making data-driven decisions um, from the very beginning at Third Love. So what would you say, you know, just an anecdote, you know, what, uh, what data or metrics have you collected that have driven the most impactful decisions that you've made for Third Love? Um, so, so many actually, but one that's really tangible that we do day in and day out here is really around customer segmentation. So we have a, about a 20 person, 25 person data, data team here at Third Love and um, they've been able to create customer segmentation that we use in almost everything we do when talking to our customers. So um, for example, we have a group of customers that's more concerned with fit um, and uh, and content versus fashion and um, kind of what the latest and greatest is. And so the emails, for example, those, those segments may receive are totally different. Um, and what that means is we're just more efficient. So we're more efficient in how we spend our marketing dollars. And it also means our, we have a better relationship with our customers because they know we know them and what they want to see. Um, but, you know, even things like down to the size size level, um, doing product analysis, um, we're leveraging data there as well to make tweaks to the product. So it's both on the marketing side and the product side. Great, thank you. Um, and Heidi and Dave, in the presentation, you mentioned um, some learnings early on for Third Love um, in manufacturing. You know, how has that shifted or changed over time uh, for you all in your approach, uh, in your thinking? What should other Sloanies keep in mind if they're thinking about uh, evaluating manufacturers? Well, first of all, that's a, uh, that, that is a good question because it was very hard. This is, we chose a very tough category. 
Uh, and I mean, who would, who would think, you know, half the population roughly wears a bra and who would think that the products that they have on, uh, that women have on are really, really hard to make, uh, make well, most importantly. So look, I think that it's been an evolution for us uh, and it did not start off overly well. Um, we were overly ambitious at the beginning in terms of our approach to manufacturing. Uh, we sort of keeping it simple would have been the smart move <laughs> when we started. We chose not to do that. Uh, and not, we won't get into the details of what we exactly did and why we chose not to keep it simple. But I think the learning was keep it simple. Uh, just, you know, try to make one, you know, you may have an ambition to make a full line of widgets or whatever it is that you're working on, uh, in our case, bras. Uh, but you should just focus on making one core great product and iterating on that product and figuring out a way to build and iterate on a manufacturing line that, that will allow you at the appropriate time uh, so you can be prepared for that to scale. Um, we had not thought through the characteristics that we would need on a manufacturing line to be able to scale this product, right? We had, we had, we had thought about it in a very nuanced, um, minute way, which was, it was incredibly siloed in this world of made on demand and high quality and all these other things that we were, we were trying to do. Uh, and, you know, having, we wanted a world where we had tons of, you know, hundred plus sizes, which we're getting close to having today, but that's many, many years later. And at the beginning, we really should have kept it far simpler. Um, so look, I would, I would uh, obviously, you know, look in the United States for early manufacturing partners if you can, because it is just easier to iterate here or in Mexico as we did initially. Um, but make sure you have a backup plan and make sure you do have sort of a, a, an Asia strategy to be able to diversify your supply chain when it's appropriate. Um, the scale at which you can operate in some of these other countries uh, outside of, unfortunately, I should say, outside of North America, uh, for the vast majority of industries, is just so much more substantial. Uh, and more than anything else, a lot of these manufacturing partners who are always looking for growth uh, and growing companies, they, they actually are far more willing, far more willing than you think, and far more willing than we think, than we thought at the beginning, to take a flyer on a new company. Um, it, again, that was contrary to what we believed at the beginning, we didn't think anybody would, and, and for the most part, they didn't but uh, answer the phone for us. But we should have kept calling uh, when we were looking at the supply chain in Asia. Uh, because what we've learned today is a lot of these companies, big and small, are more than willing to take a flyer on, on, on companies to see if it works out. So just go for it. Uh, take risks. Make a lot of cold calls. Um, spend a lot of time on the ground sussing people out. Um, and lastly, don't be fooled either because... Uh, there are some bad players out there that, that do want to, um, that are not what they say they are. So uh, if you're a smart entrepreneur with a good background, uh, you know, if somebody really, really wants to work with you badly, it, you know, maybe question and do a lot of diligence yourself. Thank you. We, we had a question come in that was something to the effect of, do you focus on great marketing or do you focus on great product? And so <laughs> the answer is probably yes. <laughs> yeah, you, have to, you have to do, I, I would actually say that uh, you focus on great product at the end of the day. Uh, I mean, both are critical, but you can only go so far with the business if you, with great marketing. Uh, if the product isn't great, if the repeat rate isn't high, uh, okay customer satisfaction and NPS isn't high, you're, you're not going to have a business. I mean, you might have something that you can generate a little bit of revenue for yourself uh, or free cash flow uh, temporarily, but it's not a business. That's just a sort of, you know, sell products as fast as you can and get out of it. Um, I mean, look, if you're, if you want to build a real business, a sustainable business with a brand um, and something that, that, you know, can turn into a full-time job for yourself and, and a team, you've got to have a great product um, well before you think about marketing. And I think, by the way, as a side note, I think we've all seen the ads on Instagram and other places for these, you know, sort of as seen on TV, I like to call it products that are just meant to get you to click on it and buy something that's pretty inexpensive or the margin's pretty high uh, where somebody's just trying to flip something around. So those are companies that are focused entirely on the marketing and they've just taken some stock product and spun it in a different way. Great. Thank you. So shifting gears a little bit um, in thinking about your 
journeys um, as co-founders of Third Love, you know, how do you balance your life uh, as partners, as business partners? You know, and what what considerations or what advice would you give to other Sloanies who are about to embark on this journey and you know, in maybe looking for their own co-founders? I don't. It's funny because we've got we've certainly been asked that before. I don't know if we have a good answer to that question because balance is really. I don't. Even, I, I don't know anybody that's ambitious in any career, uh, especially after you make the kind of investment that most of us have made in business school, uh, and you want to get the most from that investment. Uh, it's going to be pretty hard to find balance if you are ambitious. Um, that's hard to do, but it's in any career, but especially so in an entrepreneurial endeavor. In endeavor. Um, so the two of us, obviously, we live together and we're married too. Uh, so everything, the, the lines are entire, and we have two kids, the lines are entirely blurred. Uh, and I, I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what, I'm not entirely sure what balance even so means. I, I will, I'll answer it in 